Helldivers 2 is bombastic, unpredictable, unforgiving, and completely addicting. This is by far and away the most fun I've had with a co-op squad shooter in recent years. Even as I write this review, all I can think about is playing more Helldivers. The devs have come a long way from the Magicka days, and their first foray into third person action seems to be off to a good start, with some minor speed bumps here and there. So, first things first, what exactly is Helldivers 2? Well, to put it simply, it is a squad-based horde shooter where you and up to three people drop down to different planets to complete objectives and to fight back the enemy for the glory of Super Earth before extracting the safety in approximately 40 minutes. If you're getting Starship Troopers vibes from this, that's because the game was heavily inspired by the franchise. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Oh yeah! yeah! Oh yeah! As someone who adored the previous game, I lost count of how many hours I put into the Vita version back in the day, and I will admit, I was hesitant when they first revealed the sequel. I was concerned they wouldn't be able to translate the top-down gameplay into third person without making some sacrifices to the game's systems. And after roughly 41 hours, I can confidently say they put my worries to rest. As I stated at the start, Helldivers 2 is brutal and chaotic. As you and your friends dive into a mission on one of the nine available difficulties, you never quite know how the match is going to go. Sometimes it's a smooth, perfectly operated procedure where you and your friends complete everything perfectly with precision. Other times, you'll be wishing Super Earth had super health care due to the amount of limbs you cripple in a five minute span. Overall, the game is a fantastic time, but let's get into the nitty gritty of what the game offers. So, when you first load up the game, you'll be thrown into a tutorial teaching you the basics in order to earn your cape, the pride and joy of a Helldiver. During this sequence, you'll learn about premature loading, diving to avoid attacks, using grenades to plug up enemy spawns, even to avoid friendly stratagem placements. Because you see, dear viewer, the game has complete and unfettered friendly fire, and just about everything that can kill the enemies of Super Earth can assuredly kill you. Guns can kill you, grenades can kill you, your own turret can kill you, your friend's hell pod can kill you as they dive back down. Hell, even the evacuation shuttle can kill you. You can't even call down an ammo resupply without the threat of death. Point is, communication is key when it comes to coordinating stratagems to prevent you becoming a red stain on an alien world because your friend wanted to show you his best Oppenheimer impression. A beacon in the sky, looked at him. Whoa! Uh. Oh, check it out! It actually detonates on the map he because- oh, WHAT THE HERE IT COMES! Even your friendly minefields require careful movement to get through, or else. Remember, these tools are made to kill bugs and robots, but it can kill you, too. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Friendly fire may be a turnoff to some people, and I can understand that. But to me, it is a staple of Arrowhead Studios, as every single one of their previous games revolved around this system. In Magicka, you had to be careful with your wizard beams lest you disintegrate your friends, and the same philosophy applies here in Helldivers 2, only with, well, you know, significantly bigger explosions. Now, before we move on to the next portion of the video, I do have to bring up that I feel like the tutorial is way too basic in what it teaches you, as it only tells you the very basics of the game and not the finer, more useful parts of the game's systems, like being able to ping and respond to other players' pings, or being able to drop backpacks or support weapons if you accidentally picked up a friend's. Did you know that you can hold the reload button to bring up a sub-menu that allows you to change a weapon systems like switching it from auto to burst or adjusting scope zoom, or even increasing RPM? I sure did. Hell, they don't even really tell you about the stealth in the game, which is not only good, but imperative to surviving on higher difficulties. So I would suggest to the devs to maybe give a more in-depth tutorial so players are aware of some of these more advanced systems. Now, with that out of the way, once you've earned your cape and proved your loyalty and devotion to protecting the citizens of Super Earth, you are cryogenically frozen so you can be sent to the front lines. Upon being defrosted, you are given your own Super Destroyer and are allowed to name it, with any combination of pre-selected phrases. No, you cannot input your own ship names. Which I do get because the last thing I want is to join a squad, only to find I'm on the SES Skibidi Rizzler. Plus you can make some badass or hilarious names for your ship. Examples being two of my friends naming their ships the SES Bringer of Audacity or the SES Elected Representative of Family Values. But if you're a patriot like me, 
You can name your ship the SES Flames of Patriotism because the only thing the Terminators fear is the pure burning glory of Super Earth. Once that is done, you are given free reign to explore your ship. However, at the start, the explorable area is fairly small. But more sections, albeit still small, will open up as you upgrade your destroyer. But we'll get to that in a bit. On the left side, there are terminals you can visit where you can do one of three things. You can inspect the overall progress of your ship and change the name if you so desire. You can spend requisition slips to obtain various stratagems and support weapons such as orbital precision strikes, 500 kilogram bombs, machine guns, defensive shields, or even a guard dog. Because even in the far future, they are still man's best friend. Only difference being their drones and packing deadly assault weapons. What the dog doing? Or you can spend resources found and extracted from missions to upgrade your ship, which gives several beneficial passives, such as reducing deployment time, lowering cooldowns, etc. You're going to get real familiar with this terminal as you play, trust me. As you approach the bridge, you'll see the armory. Here you can equip different weapons, armor, and even change your character's wind pose, emote, body, and voice type, and even your title. You can view your boosters, and you can also observe your overall stats in the game. A useful tool to see how many enemies of freedom you brought to justice. We'll get into the weapons and armor system in a bit. Finally, on the bridge you have the Galactic War map. And upon inspection you'll see two sectors on the map. The Automatons on the left, and the Terminids on the right. As well as the overall Galactic War effort. Because you see, every single player who completes missions participates in a global galactic campaign to fight back the enemies. And as you complete missions on available planets, your efforts contribute to the overall conquest of said planets. Once a planet is conquered, we can move on to either the next planet, or if a new sector is unlocked, head to those planets and contribute to the war effort there. Here is where you'll be selecting your missions, of which there are a fair amount depending on difficulty. On the lower difficulties, you'll get relatively simple missions such as raising a flag, or uploading escape pod data, or maybe killing a brood commander or charger. But as you get higher difficulties, you'll get more challenging missions like launching ICBMs, evacuating civilians, destroying bug hatcheries, or even taking a fight to the highest enemy type there is, the terrible Bile Titan. And this is just on the bug side. On the Automaton side, you can live out your fantasy of fighting Terminators in space Vietnam as your friends are picked off one by one by artillery cannons, rocket devastators, Hulk bruisers, or just straight up a fucking tank. The number of missions and objectives also varies based on the difficulty you choose. It's also important to note that once you start an operation on a certain difficulty, you are not allowed to change it mid-operation, without forfeiting completion of said operation. Now, as you play the game, you'll have Major Orders, Personal Orders, and Effects. Major Orders are the overall mission every Helldiver has and is usually about conquering planets. Personal orders are daily missions you can do to earn extra war medals like killing certain enemies using certain weapons, etc. And effects are probably the most interesting aspect of the game, because there is a hidden mechanic called Game Masters. Game Masters are developers watching the overall progress and supposedly can watch your current squad doing a mission in real time. And they can either help you or actively mess with you. Some are game-wide, like giving everyone the railgun strategy for free, or increasing strategy redeployment time by 50%. But I swear to god, they can actually mess with your squad specifically, because I have had missions on challenging, where bugs were spawning so frequently, to the point where in the entire 40 minute mission, we had maybe 2 minutes of non-combat compared to some suicide missions that were significantly easier despite higher enemy types being there. I also recall a point when I was soloing a mission and having trouble, suddenly I was getting mortar support despite not activating a mortar site or stratagem. Whether this aspect is true or not I cannot say for sure, but what I can say is they at least give player wide buffs or debuffs which is cool. Mm. Really makes you think. In my time with the game, I have so far completed 7 of the 9 difficulties. Highest I've done being Suicide Mission. And there's a reason you're required to complete an operation on the highest previous difficulty before being able to do the next one. Because lord almighty, do these missions get hard as shit. And that's without your teammates blowing you to bits because they didn't convey they were dropping a war crime on your position. Not to stand too close to anybody. Yeah, uh -oh. they just got fucking beamed by it. <laughs> <laughs> to put this into perspective, for the Terminids, 
you start getting missions to eliminate bile titans on, I believe, the medium difficulty, which is difficulty 3. Which can be a challenging task for unprepared Helldivers. Well, the other night, my friend and I were completing a mission on the 7th difficulty suicide mission. We must have killed, I swear to god, at least 8 or 9 bile titans, as they become a standard enemy type. And trust me, there is nothing more terrifying than multiple bile titans sprinting towards your position like a dog chasing a kid with bacon in his pocket. Now, once you select the mission, you and your friends can get into your hell pods and select your loadout. Here, you can choose your weapon, stratagem, armor, and boosters to equip before diving down. Now comes the question, how do you get new weapons and armor? Well, on the ship, you'll see an option at the top of the screen that says Acquisitions. Once you open that, you'll be greeted with the War Bond page, the Superstore, and the store to buy the premium credits. In the War Bonds, one of which is free and available to everyone, you can spend medals to unlock new weapons, armor, emotes, and even super credits, the premium currency, which the free pass gives you enough to buy the premium War Bond. Okay, I said I was going to address this in the video, and now we're here, so let's just get this out of the way. There has been a controversy going around that the game is pay to win, with some people either not understanding what pay to win is, and others just straight up maliciously lying about how the game is pay to win. So I'm going to do my damnedest to make sure you guys understand exactly what is going on. First things first. Let's bring up the textbook definition of pay to win, which is as follows. In computer games, involving or relating to the practice of paying to get weapons, abilities, etc. that give you an advantage over players who do not spend money. Full stop. Whether a game is PvE or PvP does not change what is constituted as pay to win. If you can't understand this, then I weep for your English teacher. So as I said prior, there are two War Bonds. War Bonds are the game's Battle Pass system, in which you spend medals, which are only earned from completing missions on items on each page. Once you spend enough, you can move on to the next page. I have seen people saying this game is pay to win because you can supposedly pay to skip the grind, allowing you to get gear faster than a non-paying player. This is demonstrably false. Because in order to unlock new items in the War Bonds, or unlock stratagems, or upgrade your ship, you need three currencies, medals for the war bonds, requisition slips for stratagems, and samples for the ship upgrades. All of which you cannot buy with real money. You have to earn medals and requisition slips by completing missions and finding extra drops in game. As for samples, you not only need to find them on the map, but you need to extract with them on your person because if you die, you drop everything you had with you on the ground, your weapons and your samples. Luckily, either you or your friends can pick them back up, so it's not like they're lost forever. Now, the premium pass does have weapons in it, and this requires you to have either bought the Super Citizen Edition, which gives you the pass by default, or buy or amass $10 worth of super credits to unlock. This aspect does by technicality fall under pay to win, but here's where it gets interesting. As I said, you can get a thousand credits in the free pass if you max it out, allowing you to buy the premium war bond without spending any real money. But you can also find super credits in missions. As you explore, you'll come across drop pods, containers, even bunkers that can be open, and will have a random assortment of items from extra medals, requisition slips, samples, and even super credits. Each drop of super credits gives 10 credits guaranteed. Now, I decided to test this by playing solo on the easy difficulty, so I can just run around the mission and grab as many hidden areas as I can, excluding bunkers as they require two people to open. In my first mission, I found a total of four super credit drops, equating to 40 super credits. On easy, this took about 25 minutes. The second mission, I did not find a single drop, as, like with a lot of things, they are not guaranteed to spawn. But then on my third mission after, I found two drops. And in the 41 hours of playtime I have with the game, the amount of missions my friends and I went on, if I had to ballpark how many super credits we found on average, I would say at least two to three drops every mission in which we combed the map. So the game is fairly generous when it comes to giving the premium currency. The other thing you can spend credits on is armor in the superstore, which cycles every three days. And people will say, 
the armor has passives, so that could constitute as paying for an advantage, which is fair. Except the passives are the exact same passives I've seen in armor you can get in the free pass. Hell, this Riot Cup armor set's only passive is that it gives a higher armor rating. The same exact passive the armor the game gives you by default has. What a twist! It's also worth noting that capes and helmets do not grant passives. The only thing exclusive about store armor is the passive being on that particular armor set design. But I have yet to see a passive that isn't on one of the armor sets in the base war bond, which I remind you again, is free. So in reality, you aren't buying these armors for the passives. You're buying them because they look cool. They're also appropriately priced. The Riot Cop armor being one of the most expensive at 400, but others I've seen range between 125 to 200 credits. For reference, 150 credits are about $1.49 USD. Now, as for the weapons in the Premium Pass, whether they're objectively better is completely dependent on you and your playstyle. There isn't really a primary or secondary or even a grenade that you should only ever use and have on. And even if there were, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think the weapons in the Premium Pass would be these weapons. Because the first two weapons you can earn, because remember, you still have to unlock the damn things with medals, which are only earnable by playing the game, is a revolver and a rifle that does explosive damage. At first, these sound pretty strong, maybe even an objective advantage. However, each weapon in the game has its drawbacks. The revolver, while high in damage and light armor penetration, only has six shots and must load each bullet individually, making it a nightmare if you're getting attacked by swarms. The explosive rifle, while the explosive damage is nice, does overall less damage to some of the later rifles you can get in the free war bond and has a slower rate of fire. As for the incendiary shotgun and grenades, I cannot comment on as I haven't unlocked them yet, but in my experience with flame-based weaponry like the flamethrower or the incendiary mines, is they trade off high damage for slow damage over time and area denial. Put it simply, they're not going to do much against a bile titan. Another important thing to note is that if you're using weapons from the premium pass and you die in mission, players who don't have the pass can pick up and use said weapons, no problems allowing them to get a feel and see if they're actually worth getting. Now, the last aspect that could be constituted as an advantage over players are the boosters, which are buffs you can apply in a mission before you drop, which can range from spawning with full ammo and stims, granting resistance to limb injury, etc. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, you can get buffs in both the free and premium war bond. Well, that has to be pay to win, as that's an objective advantage if you use the one in the premium pass. And that's a really good point. Only problem is, the boosters are, one, permanent, they aren't limited, and you can use the same one on every single mission if you choose. And two, the buffs provided are squad-wide, which means your booster applies to every single person in the squad. So it's not exactly an advantage over other players if everyone gets the same benefit. Overall, are aspects of this pay to win by technicality? Yes. But it is not what some people believe it is. Based on some of the utter retardation I've seen over this, you would think it would be like Assassin's Creed, which not only has exclusive weapons in their cash shop, but most of the time, said weapons have exclusive abilities, weapons in the base game don't, and are significantly stronger than a lot of the base weaponry. Now, if you still choose not to support this game due to these points, that's totally and completely fair. I can completely understand not wanting to support a paid game that has microtransactions. I just want to make sure you understand exactly what is happening here, rather than listening to morons who get their uninformed opinion from other people who didn't do their due diligence in researching this topic. Now, back to discussing the game. Now, as I said earlier, the main focus of this game is dropping into randomized maps, completing objectives, and extracting the safety. On said maps, you'll have a plethora of things to do depending on difficulty. Clearing enemy nests, discovering points of interest, like cargo containers, bunkers, etc. In addition to the main objective, of which there can be several kinds of different missions. But, there are also sub-missions you can do that are highlighted in blue. These usually are the missions that would be main objectives in the lower difficulties like Trivial and Easy. But as you get to higher difficulties can become tougher missions like killing a bio titan or clearing a stalker layer. 
While you don't have to complete them, it is worthwhile to do both of these and clearing enemy nests as they give extra XP and requisition slits at the end of the mission. Hell, some side objectives actually make your mission easier, as there are radar dishes you can activate which will ping every minor point of interest on the map, allowing you to find each and every sample available. Or a Seaf artillery cannon, which becomes an extra stratagem you can deploy in mission. On higher difficulties, these sub-objectives and enemy nests will become mandatory, as clearing enemy nests will lower the overall amount of enemy spawns in the missions. So when playing on challenging or higher, make these a priority. But just because you clear out these nests doesn't mean the map will be empty. There will always be enemy patrols wandering around. And with them, you have two options. You can either A, sneak around them if you don't want to get into a fight and waste the ammo and stratagems, or B, wipe them out so they don't become a problem later. And if you choose B, you better make damn sure you kill them quickly, as they can call for reinforcements, which can become dangerous to deal with on higher difficulties. Now, since there are only two factions currently in the game you're going to be fighting, a big problem people will have, potentially, is enemy variety. And I can say at the very least, both of the enemies have a good amount of enemy types in their hierarchy. For the bugs, you have scavengers, warriors, hunters, stalkers, bile spewers, chargers, brood commanders, and bile titan. And for the automatons, you have brawlers, commissars, scout striders, berserkers, marauders, devastators, hulk bruisers, and the tanks. All of which employ different strategies and require cunning and teamwork to take down. For example, let's take the most infamous enemy currently in the game, the bug chargers. These guys are heavily armored from all sides with the exception to their ass. And as the name suggests, they love sprinting towards you like Rhino enjoys busting through walls. I just like running through walls. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you see that wall? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna run through. Oh. On your own, these can be challenging enemies as due to their high armor, most of your weapons will be ineffective. So you have to deploy a number of strategies to deal with them. You can lure them into running into a wall to stun them, giving you time to attack their weak point. If there's a cliff, you can trick them into running off it because they'll just do that. If you have a teammate, you can have a teammate act as the bait, giving the rest of the squad a chance to attack the weak point. You can even use incendiary weaponry to slowly tick down its health as fire ignores armor. But by far the most effective strategy currently is to break the armor off its legs with either a recoilless rifle or an anti-tank missile launcher. Because if you can strip its armor, you can create more weak points to hit. And that's just one enemy type. For the Hulk Bruisers on the automaton side, you can employ a similar bait strat so your teammates can hit its weak point, or you can actually destroy its arms, effectively neutering its ranged options. But be careful as they can still charge into you, turning you into a PSA on how to cross the street safely. Now, overall, I will say I find the automatons to be better balanced than the bugs. It's not too challenging to strip enemies of their weapons, and when the automatons call for reinforcements, you can actually take down the dropship, unlike the bug breaches, which you cannot seal for some reason, based on what I've seen. And some of the health pools between the bug hierarchy is ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry, but the health pool for the chargers needs to be toned down a bit. I should not be more scared of dealing with three charges than four bile titans. Overall, currently, the automatons are better to fight, but the bugs have better missions to grind for medals. Each planet I fought on as well has been a completely unique biome. From the freezing hellscape of Heath to the plains of Angel's Venture to just straight up space Vietnam, aka Malevolon Creek. And as we unlocked more planets, more biomes have been discovered which is a great motivator for the community to push these planets to completion. Now, let's talk about the interactivity of the game, because holy shit, they went above and beyond what I expected. The amount of coordination and physics this game has is ridiculous. You have objectives that require you to verbally relay the direction the radar dish should be turned towards. You have to manually adjust targeting parameters, unseal silo hatches, and they all hit the right balance of interactivity where it's just enough to be engaging and not monotonous. You also have to be careful with strategy on placement and orbital drops, because the beacons have physics. So they can just bounce off of buildings, rocks, even enemies. Hell, if you're holding one and you get knocked down, you will literally drop it. It's not going away, you'll drop it where you fell, and sayonara! And in some cases, an orbital barrage beacon can attach to an enemy as they barrel towards you, bringing the bang straight to your front door. You even have weapons like the recoilless rifle or the auto cannon that require an ammo backpack to house the ammo. And you could wear it yourself so you can slowly reload. Or you can have a friend wear it so he can quickly reload you, allowing you to unleash a barrage of destruction. Just don't stand too close to the back as there is backblast. Ah, the backblast. Hell, for the rocket sentries, 
you can actually see how much ammo is left by checking how many rockets are physically in the sentry. The attention to detail here may not impress everyone, but I appreciate the effort they put in because it makes everything feel believable. There were also a fair amount of server problems when the game launched due to the devs not expecting the amount of players, which is fair as the last game was fairly niche. They seem to have fixed it somewhat, however I still get server errors every now and then. The game definitely isn't bug free, and I don't mean the terminids. I've had crashing, clipping under the environment, to just the other night, my frame rate slowing to 4 frames a second due to me hosting. Travis, I'm getting the same bug you are, my frame rate is gradually getting lower and lower. Oh my god, this, this is insane, this is wild. <laughs> Yeah, dude, it, it's, this it's, is this is bad. This is a bad bug. This is a really bad bug. Luckily, they quickly patched this in a matter of hours, so it's currently not happening. But it's still worth noting that the launch stability of the game has been less than stellar. You sure about that? You sure about that? Update. So not only was I wrong about the patch fixing the frame rate bug, but it straight up seems worse than ever happening to players at least once within two to three missions and always when they're hosting and on the higher difficulties. As I was just playing to grab more footage and surprise surprise, my FPS tanked to sub 15 FPS. So this is a really bad bug considering the game's focus is co-op, so I really hope they can fix this soon. No. Sweet liberty. No. Another issue is honestly some of the weapon retypes need a buff. A big example being the laser weapons, and I get it, since they technically have unlimited ammo, they can't do as much damage, but I swear to god they are sometimes absolutely useless against the bugs on higher difficulties. The laser cannon in particular, I just don't see a reason I'd ever bring that over a railgun or an auto cannon, or even the grenade launcher. The same goes for some of the status effects, like napalm or static field or gas strikes, which serve as a way for you to keep enemies at bay and supposedly the static strike is supposed to stun enemies, but I swear to god, I've seen enemies run right through it no problem. Now, this could be a bug, to be completely fair, but I can't say for certain. And while the gas strikes can corrode enemies, it's similar to incendiary damage in which the damage ticks are just too low to be effective on higher difficulties. You'd be better served just bringing two turrets to heat them off you. Honestly, straight ballistic damage seems to be the way to go, and as I said prior, under this weapon type, they seem to have fairly balanced its positives and negatives. The machine pistol is great for dealing with small scale enemies quickly, but it bleeds through ammo. The pump action shotgun deals great damage, but shells have to be loaded individually. The explosive rifle is good for hitting enemies in groups, but has a fairly slow rate of fire and lower overall damage compared to other weapons. The last thing I want to talk about is the sound design and music, because my God, they did a fantastic job. The weapons are punchy, the explosives are shell shocking, and the music perfectly encapsulates the Starship Troopers vibe they're going for. The sound of an ICBM going off as the shockwave approaches us is so goddamn well executed, I can't help but wait for it to go off whenever I launch one. Your characters also have a fair amount of personality as well, from screaming things like Sweet liberty, my leg! to laughing maniacally as you continuously fire a machine gun. I swear our nameless hell divers have more personality than the last five Marvel movie protagonists. <laughs> the overall feel and tone they wanted to set for the game, I would say, has been nailed.
At the end of the day, Helldivers 2 is a co-op shooter. So while you can play solo, I would recommend this to people who have friends who are interested in playing the game, or people who don't mind matchmaking with randoms. If you're looking for a solo game, this isn't it. Helldivers 2 is a team game at its core. Arrowhead Studios set out to make a fun co-op shooter, and as far as this crab is concerned, they absolutely delivered. And thankfully, unlike the first game, is insanely more popular. So much so, they're starting to hire more devs due to the success of the game, so they can not only accelerate, but beef up content plans post-launch. Post-launch content, they stated, will be free to everyone, with mechs returning shortly after launch. If you're looking for a 4-player game you and your friends can just have fun playing, I cannot recommend Helldivers 2 enough. It's absolutely stellar.